Good day and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, TIPS uh, webinar on the theme of just transition. Um, my name is uh, Guillaume Sinclair. I'm a senior economist at Trade and Industrial uh, Policy Strategies. And uh, it will be my pleasure to be your facilitator uh, for the next couple of hours. For those who uh, may not be entirely familiar with, with TIPS, we're an economic policy research uh, institute based in Pretoria uh, and are mandated to support the development of public policy uh, in support of uh, economic development, social progress, and environmental sustainability. And we've been running uh, a series of uh, dialogue around the theme of just transition. Uh, previous dialogues are available uh, on the TIPS website if you want to catch up or if you missed any. Um, and we are very much looking forward to, to our discussion uh, today. Uh, delving into the issues around the energy level uh, at the grassroots level, uh, if, if possible. Uh, as you all know, um, the world is on the way to transition to an inclusive green economy, dealing with our uh, challenges around economic development, social progress, as well as environmental sustainability, uh, primarily uh, climate change, but not, but not only. Uh, and the agenda of ensuring that we have a just transition uh, has, has really risen to, to prominence over, over the last few years, certainly in South Africa. But, but what is a just transition? Uh, well, in the South African context, it certainly depends who you speak to. Uh, there's truly no common understanding of a just transition uh, as we are uh, discussing today. At its core, we could say that a just transition really aims to ensure that vulnerable stakeholders are better off to the transition to a green economy, or at least not negatively impacted by it. <clears throat> Yet, um, many disagree on uh, whether the just transition is a positive force for action or maybe an opportunity to hinder a, a, a process of transition. I guess it depends how we understand uh, the transition to a green economy, its speed, its depth, um, uh, do we want a transition that is wide in scope, incorporating everyone in society, uh, or very narrow, focusing communities, workers, um, small businesses, any particular stakeholder. Um, the measures as well to implement a just transition and their financing are still very much uh, a matter of opinion at this point in time, uh, rather than evidence. Uh, so lots still on the table that, that we need to debate. Um, I think ironically though, everyone agrees that we need to increase consensus on just transition. We need a better understanding. Um, we need to get out of our echo chambers, uh, our silos, and we need to really engage with each other. And this is one of the function of, of the, this platform that we have this morning, uh, to really present different views, uh, different opinions, different sets of evidence um, to inform our, our just transition uh, in the country going forward. Um, and also, of course, learn from others and hopefully bring some lessons for uh, other countries going through uh, similar uh, transitions. This morning, uh, I'm joined by four uh, eminent panelists, uh, really, who've been working on the just transition in some shape or form uh, for uh, quite some time uh, already. And I'm very pleased um, to, uh, to start our, our discussion uh, welcoming um, Mandy, uh, Mandy Rambramos, who uh, has had a long standing engagement with questions around sustainability uh, in, uh, in ESCOM. We also have uh, Richard Asley from Project 90 by, uh, by 2030, uh, who brings a different perspective from, from a kind of civil society perspective. So will Dominic Brown uh, coming from more kind of a workers uh, perspective from the uh, AIDC. Um, and finally, we'll have uh, Edabi Singh from uh, the Stellenbosch University looking at energy, energy access. 
issues. Um, before we delve in, a uh, little bit of uh, housekeeping. Just want to remind everyone that you can uh, ask questions through the Q&A function that you find at the bottom of your screen. Um, the uh, chat function is also, uh, also enabled. Uh, and uh, you should be able to uh, be careful as before you type your message to click to all panelists and attendees uh, so that everyone can see your uh, intervention. Otherwise, it is tends to be by default just for all panelists, panelists which means that not everyone can see it. Um, without further ado, um, let's move into our, our dialogue. Um, I'll give 15 minutes to each of our panelists to make initial inputs uh, and then uh, hopefully throw some questions uh, that you will raise uh, to them and then we can move into uh, a panel discussion. So first on the stage, uh, the digital stage uh, will be uh, will be Mandy from, from ESCOM. Uh, as I said, she's had a long-standing uh, engagement around sustainability issue at the utility. Um, and she now heads up the newly established Just Energy Transition Office within, um, within ESCOM. Mandy will reflect on the socioeconomic impact studies that have been uh, done by ESCOM for some of the power stations, as well as kind of the developing Just Energy uh, Transition Roadmap uh, for the utility. Mandy, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gaylor. Uh so thank you very much for the invitation from TIPS and thank you very much for that great introduction um, and for this platform that you're running. I think the dialogues have been excellent and have really started the discussion around what do we mean? And you're absolutely right. There are so many uh, different definitions and thoughts around exactly what the just transition is. So what I would like to start off with is just some context in terms of how uh, we see the just energy transition from an ESCOM perspective, and please bear in mind, this is work in progress, some thinking that we're putting on the table, but we think it's extremely important to start the discussion going. So I'm gonna set some context before I move into the uh, further discussion on it. So you would have seen a lot of media attention this weekend on ESCOM uh, talking about a JET vision of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And I think, you know, um, yes, it was a bold move to put that on the table, but I would like to explain the context and, and how we got to that thinking. I also want to just point out that we're not just saying uh, net zero emissions by 20. Um, with an increase in sustainable jobs. And so being very clear that we're not just driving the transition part, but we're also driving the just part. So how we've defined the just energy transition is that it's a tr transition towards cleaner, greener energy future while enabling the creation of new job opportunities for those displaced by the replacement of coal by these technologies. Extremely important part, the second part of it. And of course, we, we have the obligatory Venn diagram that we've started to put together. Um, I'm at this point, I'm, more, I'm very interested in hearing views around that, but the way we see it is that we are decreasing carbon emissions it comes with a lot of added environmental benefits as well, but also stimulating economic development uh, protection of jobs and increasing jobs. Remember, we also have a lot of employees. So it's not just about the communities when we talk about just, but also our own employees. And then of course, a reliable clean electricity supply, which I don't think anybody would, would argue with me on. And in terms of meeting the jet, you know, it sounds idealistic. Can we get all of those right? I think is the important question. So what does net zero mean in an ESCOM context? So we're looking at currently doing some energy modeling on reducing those carbon emissions as much as possible um, over the next 30 years, taking into account things like system requirements, costs, the ability to build capacity, all of those issues. So the net means that we will have some residual emissions as we work towards uh, decarbonizing the, the grid. But that does mean that, it doesn't mean that we can't get to that point. You know, I think 30 years is a long time a lot of technology disruptors that could come into play. And that is something we must always bear in mind. It does mean though, that if we do have any emissions left in the system, they will be balanced. This is a non-exhaustive list of things like investing in projects that would remove carbon from the atmosphere, uh, natural, nat natural climate solutions, agriculture and forestry projects. I know these can be quite controversial in terms of leakage and permanence, 
But all of those things are things that are currently under discussion and currently being worked on by the scientific community and a lot of um, organizations out there. You could also look at buying carbon credits from the carbon market, but these must be additional. Um, you know, having worked in the carbon market area for many, many years, uh, my, my one big ask is when we talk about environmental integrity of carbon credits, they must be additional. But I think that's a subject of a whole other webinar, so I won't get into that. And we're also evaluating various options for financing. You know, there's no secret um, the, the financing challenges we have as ESCOM. So we're looking at what are those financing alternatives that will not put additional pressure on the fiscus. Just in terms of some of the pegs in the ground when we talk about net zero, uh, I've said this and I, I will keep saying it, that the just and the transition are equally important. We can't just talk about reducing emissions without thinking about the impact on society, on our employees and on the people around us. The jet will occur in a phased manner over time. It's not an abrupt change, but I think you will all agree with me, it is a radical change uh, for ESCOM itself. Enablers include, you know, without doubt, financial and policy support. Cost reflective tariffs are very key to enable this whole electricity system movement. And then very importantly, and Gelo uh, uh, alluded to this as well, this the JET or the just transition for South Africa, the just energy transition as we look at it from an ESCOM perspective is not something any one of us can do by ourselves. We need collaboration across government, business, civil society, academia, that will drive a success story for South Africa. And I think that is what we need to do is look at what is the greater good and how do we drive that for South Africa? Again, it might sound very idealistic, but I think it is something we can achieve if we work with that collaboration in mind. Also, like I've already said, none of us can predict what technologies disruptions may come across. As soon as um, 2030 or as late as 2040, that can set us on this path to net zero. And I think we must not close the doors without first looking into the opportunity. I've always been technology agnostic. Um, you know, we have to look at what the opportunities uh, they bring, but we also then can't be completely oblivious to the, um, you know, the unintended consequences. So I think we need to really evaluate the opportunities we have out there. So this slide was just about setting the context of, of where we're coming from on the just energy transition. In terms of where we are, you know, the, the roadmap we have uh, for the just energy transition from ESCOM that we're working on, we're actually looking backwards from 2050, 2040, 2030, 2020 to look at what sort of decision making we need now, what kind of innovations will come in the future. Um, and if we look at the near term uh, challenges we have, um, it's also no secret that we will be closing down power stations by uh, 2040, about 10 of them. And then further on from that, we will be looking at more power stations that are shutting down. So these are taken uh, from the IRP. Um, and you know, when we look at this plan, you, it's a lot of megawatts that we're looking at shutting down and not just the megawatts, but the people linked to those megawatts. And so we're looking at what are the opportunities in terms of repurposing and repowering. So we're looking at establishing this innovative framework as we manage and close the stations. Um, when we look at our roadmap from now to 2050, it's not just about the technology, but about each of these power plants that we're shutting down and how do we then address the socioeconomic uh, development challenges. So I won't talk too much about some of the other technology uh, issues and repurposing and repowering, but focus a little more in, in the next few minutes on the socioeconomic impact studies. So we're currently undertaking these studies um, for Hendrina Krutple and Komati. And we're looking at the current impact categories that are being investigated, those that are on the screen uh, from a local context, a regional context and a national context. And as you can see, there are a number of categories that we cut across in terms of the impact being investigated. Things like quality of life, access to services, social ills. Komati, for example, you know, provides additional services to just electricity. We look at uh, water services as well provided for Komati Port. So you have to look at those kind of impacts and how that would impact the local context and the people as we shut down that plant. Uh, from a regional and a national context, we're also looking at what is the impact across Mpumalanga, but also across South Africa in terms of economic sustainability, the business impact, government revenue, all of those things that will be impacted by the shutdown of these plants. And then from an environmental perspective as well, it's the land uses, the quality of the environment and the access to natural resources. So as you can see, 
quite a broad range of impact categories that are being investigated in the local, regional, and national context and across people, economy, and the environment. So where are we with this uh, study? There's quite a lot of work uh, done thus far. Um, we've, uh, it's urban econ um, development economists that are assisting us with these studies and are doing an excellent job in terms of the work, that, the, the baseline studies, the current work that has been done on stakeholder engagement and the economic modeling that has been done. So what has been completed thus far is the inception report. We've got our baseline report. Uh, a, a lot of stakeholder engagement has been done. This was delayed the last couple of months due to the lockdown and restrictions on face-to-face -face meetings, but I've started now in earnest and quite a number of engagements have been done. And as you can see, we, we, we're trying to reach a, a number of um, local communities through the ward councillors, through the local NGOs, and also speaking to businesses themselves, you know, from the big pick and paste to the small spaza shops in terms of the impact of the power station shutdown. Um, and then also looking at local community business interviews and, and looking at facility audits. So a number of stakeholder engagement um, has been done. And then the economic modeling also has been completed from a national perspective in Pumalanga and the local Steve Strete municipality and the other municipalities that will be impacted by the power station shutdown. And that looked at the employment, economic sustainability, business impact and government revenue. So what is currently ongoing? So those things are things that are being completed. We're still continuing with our primary data, data gathering at the power station sites, uh, completing the business survey and looking at uh, a household survey. And then very importantly, you know, it's not just about uh, what is the impact, but what is or what are our mitigation plans? Uh, we're currently also looking at power station information and labor engagement, which still needs to be done extremely important from our governance perspectives before we can share information and data and results outside we need to have this engagement with labor so th these are the things on the critical part of the study is our hr plan development for our own employees these labor engagements and then the mitigation plans as well we aiming to complete the study by march 2021 as i say this timeline was delayed due to covid but we we on track on at the moment and things are looking good in terms of the actual study. So when I talk about mitigation plans, you know, in uh, concurrently with doing the socioeconomic impact studies, we're looking at what are the mitigation aspects that we can look at, bearing very much in mind that what we're driving towards is a social compact. So not dictating to communities, but having a discussion on communities in what would be best for that area. Um, and, and looking at this through our repurposing and repowering program. So just from a social compact perspective, it's how do we contribute to the social plan development for the plant shutdown? What is the opportunities for, for jobs? You know, how do we increase those job opportunities? How do we preserve and grow socioeconomic development of communities? Um, I think, you know, the communities are very concerned, of course, with the plant shutdown for obvious reasons, but are also looking for what are the opportunities when we repurpose? Are there opportunities for those communities as well? And the potential for localization through manufacturing and reindustrialization is key. We're working with a on a terms of reference with the DTIC for that. Um, and I think it's, you know, there's such a great opportunity there again for collaboration, working together to, to move forward on these kinds of aspects. Um, in terms of repurposing, so the difference when we talk about repurposing and repowering. Repowering, we're talking about electricity generation, but with different energy sources, um, you know, at those same sites. They're not mutually exclusive. When we talk about repurposing, it's how do we optimize on agricultural practices or bulk water service, water treatment, uh, demineralized water, looking at potable water, those kind of services. Uh, but these two are not mutually exclusive. You can look at repowering with renewable technologies while we have agriculture on the same piece of land. You know, so these are the kinds of options we're looking at. Again, these lists are not exhaustive, but kind of options that we are looking at. So in terms of uh, um, the repowering and repurposing, as you know, we did put out uh, RFI and EOI into the market. Uh, those processes are closed and we're currently evaluating those options and looking at now, what is the best plan going forward and how do we accelerate these options? I think very importantly for Komati, Hrutke and Henrina, we're looking at a very committed, focused effort now on accelerating, repurposing and repowering for those sites 
especially given the impact on, on the communities. And I just want to end on this last point that I've made before, but I think also important to emphasize is that we are looking at collaborative and partnerships approach. Um, as I've said, you know, this is not something we, we can do alone. We need to look at how do we work together collaboratively and constructively to move forward the just energy transition agenda in South Africa. Uh, thanks, Gayla. I'll stop there. That's my last slide. Thanks so much, uh, Mandy. I think that was that was a really good overview uh, and a good update of what what ESCOM is, is is busy with at the moment. Um, I want to remind everyone to to start uh, you know, kind of throwing your questions uh, through the Q and A. There's there's already a, a couple of them, uh, Mandy, which I I do want to quickly throw uh, throw back to you, I guess. Um, the first one really, uh, I think you, you touched on it, but um, I guess it's, you know, do you only look really at, you know, the ESCOM employees or do you extend on uh, your approach to surrounding communities and small businesses? I think you, you, you quite sort of looked at that a little bit, but maybe you can expand on how you're going to do that. Because of course, you know, the ESCOM employees are one thing you know, that's within your control, but the rest is not necessarily directly directly within your control and I guess I'll add to that maybe how are you planning on working with the mines because that's where the bulk of the employment is actually effectively um, the, the second question uh, is uh, is really around um, the appetite for um, for ESCOM to invest in renewable energy gener generation so I think just to get an idea from from you on of course is that something on the cards uh, and, and how do you take do you take that that question? There's a question about the availability of the social impact uh, studies. I think you can answer that. It's you know to be completed by March 2021. So uh, you know, I don't think they're available quite just yet, uh, but you can you can clarify that if need be. Um, uh, and, and I guess um, uh, couple of other questions are coming in now. So uh, let me also throw them back to you. Uh, what are the alternative financing options that ESCOM is, is, is considering, I guess, to, to, to look at a, a just transition from an ESCOM perspective? Again, acknowledging that, of course, you know, and, and you pointed it out, you know, it's not just an ESCOM matter. You know, we can't, we can't expect ESCOM to do that on its own. We need everyone. Um, uh, and I guess the last question for now uh, is, um, are you doing anything in terms of reskilling? Uh, and then to what extent uh, is that looking at, at uh, alternative, I guess, job opportunities, you know? And, uh, and if you are looking at reskilling, reskilling to what, I guess, is the question, you know? Um, there's a lot of people saying, of course, you know, renewable energy, but again, we've, we've been saying, you know, for quite some time from a tips perspective, there's no reason to limit ourselves to renewable energy. And I think you pointed to that, you know, there's many opportunities out there. Um, yeah, so maybe let's uh, let's start with, with, with that. Uh, there's already quite a few, so uh, yeah, over to you. Great, thanks for that, Gayla. Uh, yeah, just a few. <laughs> so uh, let me just try and address them very quickly. So I, I also don't want to take up too much time. We have other excellent speakers lined up. Um, so we're not just looking at our employees. Uh, the reason why I pointed that out when I said employees is often when I give presentations or talk about our, our Just Transition program, I talk about the communities around us and then our employees saying, what about the employees? So we actually are looking at both, uh, but like Ayla rightly pointed out, some of the mitigation plans we're looking at, we would have to work in collaboration. I mentioned DTIC, uh, but we're also looking at working in collaboration with Minerals Council in terms of how do we increase job opportunities uh, for the community and for the local um, employees in the mines, in the power stations and, and around there. So it's not just the employees looking at comprehensive plans. Obviously, like Gaylo says, we have more control over how do we manage employees in terms of redeployment, reskilling. Uh, but I think from a local community perspective, that's where the collaborative efforts with the likes of Minerals Council, DTIC, the CSIR comes into play in terms of how can we do that together. Um, the CSIR is looking at a uh, reskilling lab uh, soon uh, together with Rest for Africa. So we're involved in that as well to look at what are the potentials for reskilling. Um, I always say, you know, a turbine engineer is a turbine engineer, whether you're looking at a steam turbine or a wind turbine. Of course, there is some reskilling involved, 
and retraining involved. So that's, that's the easier. The higher skilled areas are easier in terms of reskilling, but we're also looking at what is the potential for reskilling uh, low level skills or current low level skills or unskilled labor to take on some of these new repurposing and repowering issues that we're talking about. And exactly, it's not just about repowering, it's also repurposing. You know, when you look at some of those options we had on the repurposing, can we then create more skills in those areas? Are the kinds of things we, we're looking at. Um, so we are very keen on, on renewable energy. Um, you can quote me, ESCOM saying we're keen on renewable energy. But of course, our debt uh, in our balance sheet cannot take on any more debt. We are highly indebted, uh, something I don't need to, again, tell this audience about. So we're looking at what are the opportunities for financing, uh, grant financing, obviously, but also there are uh, opportunities for concessional loans, which again will add to the debt. You know, So that's something we're looking at very carefully. But like I said on one of my slides, we're quite keen on partnerships as well. So investigating funding models and partnership models that it will allow us to not only invest ourselves in renewables, but enable more renewables in the country. So those are the various options uh, we're looking at. Uh, the studies that we're currently busy with are not available right now. Like I say, there's still, you know, there's still some work to be done. There's still labor engagements that need to happen. So we need to go through those uh, processes before we are able to share the, the modeling results, for example, the quantitative results. But we're you know, happy to talk about some of the qualitative results uh, that are coming out. Some of the alternative financing I touched on already. So we're looking at in the repurposing, uh, repowering, you know, there's, there's availability of project financing from DFIs. Some of it comes with grant funding. Some of it comes as concessional loans. So we would need to look at what is the possibility for us, but also, like I say, uh, partnerships in that respect will be quite important. We're also currently investigating a just transition, a just energy transition transaction on whether it's possible to crowd in climate financing for um, an accelerated emissions reduction over the next 30 years. We're currently uh, doing the energy modeling and the financial modeling for that and speaking to funders in terms of their interest. As you know, through the climate financing world, uh, there is climate financing available for emission reductions. So we're considering those options, including the carbon market, carbon credits, and those kinds of things. So those are the various alternative you know, the landscape for carbon pricing is actually huge. So we're looking at those various uh, options. And like I say, when it comes to uh, this question on reskilling, um, you know, it's iterative as well. We need to, to finish some of the studies. We need to look at some of the EOI and RFI ideas that are coming out in terms of the kinds of skills that will be needed. But I'd like to end on one point that what we do need in a just uh, transition environment going forward generally is flexibility in, skill, in skills. We need multidisciplinary skills in people uh, to not only just look at what are my technology solutions, but what are the socioeconomic issues related to those technologies? So we need people that will be able to think in that broader multidisciplinary uh, kind of environment going forward. So you know, there's various things that we're looking at and, and more than happy to discuss it offline with people as well. Thanks, Gail. Thanks so much, uh, Mandy. I think you did a great job uh, looking at the questions. There's still some of them coming. We'll try and, and take them uh, in our panel discussion a bit a bit later. Um, now let, let's turn to, to our second uh, second panelist. Um, we will bring a, a bit of a different perspective, I'm sure. Um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, Richard Asley, who is a researcher at uh, Environmental NGO Project 90 by 2030. Uh, he also coordinates the Electricity Governance South African Network, um, and he will present uh, work that uh, Project 90 by 2030 has been doing around uh, a just energy transition in South Africa and, uh, to quote the title, Remaking Our Energy Future. Um, so very keen to hear uh, Richard's perspective on, on those issues. Um, Richard, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much for that. Great, thanks for tips for the opportunity. Um, and a lot of these, these dialogues have been great. Um, I'm gonna move through this quite fast because this is some research we did over a year ago, but there's quite a lot to it. So this is just the high level tour of it. Um, just seeing the stopwatch, so stay to time. Very briefly, who is Project 90? Um, we're an NGO. The vision is to inspire and mobilize society towards a sustainably developed and equitable low carbon future. 
So part of the mission is to bring about significant positive change in the way we as humans engage with earth systems and each other. So obviously part of this speaks to the dust energy transition we're talking about today. Um, so yeah, this is the report. It's from September 2019. The whole report's uh, freely available online. And I'm just going to talk you through some of the high level stuff. Firstly, why did this report focus on coal? Um, what can we learn internationally from coal phase out? What are some of the lessons and what are the recommendations? So that's what you guys are in store for. Um, this is probably fairly obvious to most people who are involved, but to quickly go through why did we look at coal? Well, firstly, there's um, environmental damage due to mining, uh, power stations uh, burning coal um, responsible for pollution, um, a large percentage of our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, roughly 85%, possibly slightly less with the latest stats, um, is electricity is from coal. A lot of ESCOM's financial um, problems are related to, to coal and, you know, there has been opposition to renewable energy um, from the fossil fuel sector. So that's why we looked at coal. And then just to come to South Africa, this was a, a ranking by the World Economic Forum saying that we are 114th out of 115 in terms of our readiness to, for an effective transition. And FES, which is Frederick Ebert Stiftung, which um, also funded this work um, in, a, in a 2017 report, put us uh, at the bottom of a list in terms of global south. So what this means is we've got a long way to go and we need to get the basics right. So in terms of getting the basics right, we had a quick look around at what have other countries done in terms of coal phase out. Um, and if you look what's happened in the UK since 1920, both coal employment and coal production has dropped almost to zero. Um, this was mainly driven by um, cheaper alternatives, so it was economic. And the important thing here is it wasn't particularly organized. Um, it was reactive measures, they were ad hoc. Um, and this led to a year-long miners' strike in 1984 and 1985. These are just some images of that. Um, and this is the kind of thing we'd want to avoid in South Africa. You don't want to end up with um, you know, violence on the streets. Uh, and again, remember, this is the very brief overview. The report has got a lot more detail. Um, in Spain, at a country level, similar situation. Coal production and employment have gone down, not entirely to zero, but significantly. Um, the drivers there were that the mines were no longer competitive with imports, um, and it was, again, high costs. But in this case, the government had a, a very set plan. We are going to phase out coal, and they had certain targets and numbers. Um, and in 2018, there was a, this they call the Plan del Carbon, um, and that basically used um, uh, subsidies to the coal industry for a sustainable development plan. And it has been recognized as at least, you know, working with unions is, is, is a good way to go, um, in contrast to a lot of the opposition from the United Kingdom. If we turn to the Netherlands, instead of looking at a country level, this is what we termed a regional conversion. So in Lindbergh, um, and again, important to note, it happened over a long time period, they were able to convert from a predominantly coal mining area to, to other services. Again, the same sort of theme that was due to um, the largest gas field provided cheaper alternatives. Um, and something to note here is that Unlike the UK, there were not significant labor protests. And it appeared that people recognized, look, the change is here. It's economic. Let's work together. And the really interesting part is the Dutch state mines who ran a lot of them realized, look, um, you know, labor worked out. If, if we work together with them while the mining company still has money, we might actually come off better. Um, so instead of resisting it, they work together. Uh, to move to Germany, an area called Ruhr, again, a very long time period. Um, densely populated, so there are other options available. Um, some of the mines have now become heritage sites. Um, and uh, again, the drivers, the same sort of theme. It was um, more competitive options and also air pollution became a big concern there. There was resistance, um, but in the long run, they converted to a knowledge economy, 22 universities were built. And more recently, there was a coal commission to plan phase out the remaining power stations. Um, two more countries, uh, Canada, what's happened here is that um, their coal phase out plans have been done in a way that's in line with the ILO, which is International Labour Organization guidelines on just transition. 
Um, a big driver here was a change in the ruling party. Um, the politics then, then, then swung the decision. And again, pollution was a, a driver. They set up things like a task force to deal with just transition. Um, they had funds for it. Obviously, as many people will know, it's not that they necessarily went to renewables. There's big oil and gas, but at least there was on the coal side, um, a justice angle to the transition which is underway. Last country we're looking at is Australia and a specific area uh, called the Latrobe Valley. It was home to one of their biggest power stations, Hazelwood. And it closed quite suddenly, which is not a good thing. Um, but out of this, they created something called the Latrobe Valley Authority, which as we discussed in our report, might be a good model for other work. Um, and even though the closure was sudden, the federal government pumped a lot of money into looking at infrastructure, job creation, um, and diversification. And the same with the state of Victoria, which was the, the largest grant in, in Victorian state history. And the important thing about the Latrobe Valley Authority, the main lesson is that it's a bottom up and top down. So basically it's local people who run the program, but government provides the money. And that combination seems to have worked reasonably well. So, what we did out of all of this, we looked at all these countries and we said, what are the patterns? What kind of framework can you come up with? And I'll take you through this uh, as briefly as I can. So the first important thing is you must speak to people first. Like you, that, everyone seems to agree on this. And um, if we looked at some of the countries, some of them got it right. Uh, in the Netherlands, they even accepted it, uh, whereas some got it a bit wrong. Um, the next one, obviously, comes to once you've had some discussions, you need to, to look at planning. Um, so again, some countries have done, have done better with that. Then all the lessons point that you need to look at what's happening at the local circumstances. Every country is different, every region is different. So in that aspect, Australia with the Latrobe Valley Authority have done a good job at working out what, what do they need to do. The next step is giving an honest answer to um, this question here of how dependent is the regional economy on coal. If you're highly dependent to rural area where mining is the only sort of set of things you need to do, then if it's a low dependence where the, the economy is already diversified. Um, in the case where you can convert from coal to something else, as we've seen in Germany and the Netherlands, you then need to look at this whole process of how do you how do you change the workforce. So within this, within these dark blue areas, um, four key things come out. And just to go through them quickly, is the first one is you need to create an alternative industry. We can't move away from coal and not have another option. And unfortunately, this is where Spain got it wrong. And there's a great, great quote about saying, you know, there's no job opportunities here, um, but we have the best roads and streetlights. So they spent all their money on infrastructure, but they didn't create an alternative industry. The one at the top here does speak to infrastructure. If you want businesses to open up and you want workers to stay, you need to invest in the area itself, uh, into diversification and to make the area attractive. This one I could speak for a whole hour on itself. I mean, empowerment of workers, there's a whole list which I won't go through. It's not just about one job to another. There's various options. Uh, Spain worked particularly on early retirement. Unfortunately, internationally, a lot of the retraining efforts have, have been problematic. Um, so that is something we need to consider in this country carefully before going that route. It's important, but it's just there are things to be aware of. And obviously looking after the environment is, is another part of this. Um, and without talking on this further, the whole bit down here is that these four factors, you need to balance them. Each area is different. Some will require a lot of work in one area and others in a different area. So our recommendations that came out of this um, is the first one is what should be in a plan, who should do it and who should pay for it. Um, quite a tall order, but what should be in a plan? We identified five things that you must think about when you're planning for just transition. It comes out of the coal sector, but it can be applied in other areas. Um, and just if you look at the main headings, first, you need to look at, at what happens with your electricity supply um, in these changes. Um, the second one speaks to, to businesses. You know, What do we do about business as usual? How do you get corporations to prioritize environmental and social justice issues? 
The third one looks at this idea of ownership, and we've actually done a whole different study on that. Um, but from a justice perspective, if all the money of the transition just goes to, um, to, to, to businesses and, and not to the people concerned, that is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, the, the fourth one is, is, again, what the labor movement have often focused on uh, and is very important, but it is one of the five, is, is empowerment of workers, jobs, training, all of that kind of thing. And the fifth one deals with environment. Um, so those are fairly self-explanatory. Um, now the next one, this is just our idea. Uh, we thought, okay, um, who, who's going to do this in South Africa? So what we thought is that if, if government could establish a, a national task team that looks at just transition, um, they would then make recommendations. At least that is a, a body that is now responsible for it. Um, the government sort of level also having a, a bill or at least some legal backing for just transition work. This has been done in Scotland and other countries, um, plus some at least basic financing for social protection around jobs. Then a just transition platform, this could be an extension of what the National Planning Commission have done, but some area where people can talk about this. I mean, essentially these tips webinars in a way are, are one type of consultation platform, but if there's a broad one nationally, that would be great. And that can be how you develop your, your national plans and that. But it's not just about what happens nationally. So, well, okay, so the last one here is um, integrated planning is that there needs to be coordination be between the various aspects. But moving on to what happens locally. Now, this could be in Mpumalanga. It, it could be around refineries in, in Durban if you move out of the coal sector. So. The idea is that you'd have local teams, and this is a lot of this comes out of the ideas from Australia, like local people knew what to do best. Uh, they knew who could actually get the work done and they knew who could do the training. And also just to have a physical building or at least a, a center where some of this work happens um, is, is an idea that could work. And this is where you can really talk with your, your communities and your, your workers because they are often distant from the national process. And this one down here, an important one of like assessing what needs to be done and, and an honest answer on how important uh, and, and energy service providers are. And this is where the local plans come up, which can obviously dovetail with government ones, but they speak specifically to the needs of each area. And these are just, um, at the end, just some ideas for who could pay for it, because it's all very well having these lofty ideas and saying, well, look, the economy is struggling. How are we going to pay for this? Um, so the conversion of fossil fuel subsidies is one angle. Uh, that's what Spain have done. And anyone in this country who's looked at fossil fuel subsidies will know they're very hard to get hold of and there's not a lot of transparency. Uh, one figure we found was 56 billion Rand for 2016, 17 alone. And as some of you might have also seen some work um, by Mark Swilling and others and Michelle Kravach and estimated that you know, only 6 billion Rand would at least be a starting point for just transition in South Africa. So to give you an idea of, of coal subsidies, that's, that's one uh, potential opportunity. Uh, you could put a line in the national budget. That's what a lot of countries have done. That's difficult if it's strained uh, at the moment. Uh, already been mentioned by Mandy, uh, innovative finance models that could access international climate finance, um, what Meridian Economics have been working on, the just transition transaction. Um, there's, there's that kind of angle. An interesting one about uh, tax avoidance. Um, we did some digging for numbers and found that it's about 100 billion rand a year over 2010 to 2014. So if you could really stop people avoiding tax, then you could use it for lots of things, health, um, education, but it could also go um, to transition initiatives. Um, in terms of the bottom corner there, you know, the transition fund for companies, it could sort of be a uh, a, a version of CSI where, where they're looking after their own workers and the changes that are needed. And, um, you know, the carbon tax at the moment, you know, if that was ring fenced and you could take a portion of the funds um, and also remove some of the exemptions at the moment. These are just some ideas, you know, um, it, it, we are going to require money to do any of these, um, but there are avenues uh, that you can, can look at. Um, there's others, um, divestment angles, uh, PIC is Public Investment Corporation. Um, so, you know, let's, let's work out what we need to do and then, and then how we can fund it. And um, that's it for me so far. Uh, there's my details if anyone wants, and obviously the presentation will be available. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Richard.
15 minutes uh, on the dot, uh, literally. <laughs> uh, so appreciate that. Um, yeah, great, great overview, really. I think that was that was really grounded in the experience of other countries, um, and and really what uh, what we can do in South Africa. A lot of a lot of food for thought. Um, so there's a few questions uh, coming uh, coming your way, uh, which I'll, I'll I'll throw I'll throw to you now uh, very briefly. Um, uh, two that seem quite similar. Um, sort of what approach do you recommend for stakeholder engagement? Uh, and you know, I think it, it you know what do you foresee the consultation with local communities should include? I think it kind of ties to who do you consult with, how do you consult? You know, you can't talk to everyone, of course. Uh, and you know how how can you make that process as inclusive as possible? Um, then there's a suggestion. I think it's more comment <clears throat> around green bonds uh, to finance as well. Um, and, and I guess I'll throw one uh, one question as well around you know you you've showed um, the need for you called it uh, I think a just transition test test team or <clears throat> kind of a sort of an institutional form that would that would kind of lead this um do you feel that uh, that the upcoming presidential commission that has been announced uh which we don't know all the details of agreeably yet um but do you feel that that would be an appropriate or could be an appropriate kind of vehicle uh to drive drive the transition uh forward um yeah maybe let's start let's start with that yeah okay thanks for those um, so the first question is very serendipitous, I guess, in terms of stakeholder engagement, a report that we're just wrapping up this week, and we're having a launch of this Thursday, if anyone's interested, is looking specifically at um, stakeholder engagement around these issues, particularly for communities. Um, so we've done a whole lot of work on that. And I mean, it's, again, I could talk for quite a long time on that. That's it, it's difficult and complicated, particularly at the community level. You need to have uh, community liaison officers who, who know how, how to deal with communities. You need to build relationships. It's about trust. These are not the kind of things that, that happen overnight. And I mean, some people who have been living in very difficult circumstances, whether it's with their energy availability or have been stressing about losing a job for years, in, it, it, it's not just a straightforward, uh, we can have a meeting and it'll be done in, in a few hours. Um, the community work we've done at Project 90 over the years, it's, it, it takes a long time. And that's partly why setting these things up sooner rather than later is important because we'll, we'll get a bit ahead with that time. Um, the question about green bonds, I mean, we haven't delved into any of the finances in particular. Our idea was to just point out that let's not get paralyzed by the fact that the economy is struggling and there's this perception of there not being money. If one is inventive, we believe that you can find the money and there are a number of ways we can do it and that you'd probably use a combination of all of them. In terms of the management, I mean, we had quite a few debates when we were putting this report together. Um, that, that, that national sort of um, committee to oversee just transition, I mean, the, the P4C could uh, do that. The experience we've seen is that, I mean, it's been, I think that was from the job summit in October 2018, it still hasn't really come together, you know, it, that's, that's a very long time to not have anyone in control of what's happening. Um, so I think our main point is that someone needs, there needs to be a body of some sort to oversee it, not to do everything, um, but just to check that other members of the orchestra are playing their part. So I think, I mean, those are probably some short answers to those for now. So are there any more questions? Great, thanks. Well, there is, there is the, yeah, there, there is another one, which is kind of the million dollar question, but um, what, do you, what do you see as sort of the major, the major bias or, or, or locking factors in, in getting the, the just transition going in South Africa? And I guess I will, you know, I mean, this is obviously quite a broad question, but I would kind of frame that, you know, what do you think would be maybe the sort of immediate first steps to get this going? You know, I think we, we talk a lot about the need for a just transition. Um, we've heard about what ESCOM is doing, but we also know that, you know, ESCOM can't do that alone. We've acknowledged that. Um, so what are some of the immediate things that need to happen, I guess, to, to, to get this going? 
yeah, I mean, that, that, that's not a simple one, but I mean, just to, to pick up on some of the international examples we had, you'll see, or if you remember, that a lot of the drivers were economic. It was discovery of the largest gas field. It was cheaper imports in Spain. It was high prices of, of um, local mining. And, and particularly in the Netherlands example, you know, that acceptance that economically it made sense, that overcame a lot of the barriers. That's why in the Netherlands there weren't um, many protests. Um, it was just clear, like, it, this is the economically sensible thing to do. And I do think that if in this country we can really understand and push the economic aspects of it, it's obviously all the social aspects are important, but, you know, in the economy we live in, you know, rands and cents make a difference. Um, and, you know, the, the awareness of stranded assets is increasing. I mean, banks are pulling out of investing in coal. And I do think that this can be a way to help get some momentum on it. Um, and this is, we've seen in other countries, like it, it's economic drivers. Um, and there's not a shortage of evidence that economically, this is the way we should go. No, I think we're all trying to find the answers to the question. So I think, you know, of course, the more, the more food for thought we can, we can throw, the, the better it is. Um, great, I think we, we'll leave it at this for now. Um, please, I put in, in the chat box, the link to the actual report. Um, but Richard, if you can maybe put the link to the engagements that you're having later this week, that would be that would be fantastic as well, um, so that people have access to the invitation, uh, if that's okay. if that's possible. I think that'd be yeah. fantastic. I'll I'll go and look for that while the next person is chatting. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks so much, uh, Richard. Um, <clears throat>
to some kind of transition away from fossil fuels to renewables. And I just take some uh, screenshots of recent reports just over the past few weeks following the most recent IEA report, which once again tries to portray the view that, well, the shift to, to renewables is actually inevitable. And some are even going as far to say that before the election of, uh, before the ending of the US election, regardless of who was elected, whether it were Trump, whether it be Trump or Biden, that the shift away from fossil fuels is also inevitable. Uh, no uh, consideration for the fact that uh, the Republicans will still probably remain as the majority in the Senate and that it will be unlikely for Biden to be able to push through on his so-called uh, Green New Deal. So this is obviously uh, what we're seeing. And the argument is that the levelized cost of energy the, has become down so dramatically uh, in terms of, and, and if you look at the falling cost of renewables in general, uh, economically, the market will invariably and inevitably turn away from fossil fuels and invest uh, uh, more in renewable energies. So that's, that's the argument. And most of us um, have bought into this view that this is in fact what's happening. But when taking a closer look at the numbers, and I just took some screenshots of some Excel uh, tables that I did. And then you would see that the transition to renewables is actually not uh, on the way. Uh, so just in terms of energy consumption, for example, by, by fuel and taking renewable energy as a percentage of total energy consumption by fuel, you will see that in fact, globally, renewables consumes of the consumption of renewables makes up less than 5% of total energy consumption by fuel. And since between 2018 and 2019, it's grown by less than a half a percent. So this is the first thing. Then I looked a little bit further. Um, this is from the uh, uh, BP statistical overview. Um, and I can send links to reports if people would like it. And uh, checked out what is renewable energy as a total, uh, as a percentage of total energy generation. And once again, you will see highlighted in yellow there in 2018, renewable energy made up 9.26% of total uh, energy generation and has grown by about one point, just over 1.1% in that year to now make up just over 10% of uh, total as a percentage of total energy generation. And then I was still even more curious because this doesn't, first of all, give the breakdown between wind and solar and hydro and so on. And so we as AIDs investigate further and going then into the, I think it's okay, maybe not the most recent, but the EIA um, or EIA uh, monthly energy review of May 2020. And as you can see in the table below, took the data from 1950 to 2019. Um, and also from that, then extrapolated the percentages of renewable energy over this time period. And this would be uh, renewables as a percentage of total electricity production. This is not just energy uh, usage. So it includes what you burn to make renewables as well. And a lot of time, uh, the mining and so on. And when you take renewables from wind and solar in particular as a percentage um, of total primary energy production, in 2019, it was just 3.74%. And if you look in that column, uh, this third column here, if you can see it, whoops, sorry. You can see that the growth over the past uh, 10 years has been pretty slow and, and, and is indicative of the fact that 
there's actually no energy transition happening. And so what is actually happening is that we are seeing an energy expansion taking place globally, where there's effectively a parallel rise in both energy production from fossil fuels, as well as renewable energy, slightly more from renewables. So we're not seeing a displacement of fossil fuels um, within the energy mix. And just to say, I'll quote uh, from the 138 page document um, that we produce on transformed ESCOM, which says, uh, which quotes Spencer Dale, the BP's group chief economist who says that despite the extraordinary growth in the renewables, there's been almost no improvement in the power sector fuel mix over the past 20 years. I had no idea that so little progress had been made until I looked at these data. So I, I implore everyone to look at the data uh, and see for yourself because what's happening is um, if we continue with this view um, that there's a transition happening, it's not only misleading, but it's dangerous. But I'll show more now. If we look at carbon emissions, and if you look at it over the past uh, 10 years, you see that whilst there's been a downward trajectory since 2017, there's still, in terms of how much growth there is, there's still an increase in the level of carbon emissions each year. And based on those trends, we also, and con on current investment levels uh, in renewables, um, we will see a continuation of this and effectively we will not be able to meet our climate targets in time. And what we see, uh, what lies behind this for us is what we understand to be the threefold effect or what we summarize to be the threefold effect. And that is um, the idea that the falling renewable energy costs will drive uh, a renewable energy transition to the market is wrong for two reasons, okay? The first is those costs don't truly reflect the costs of what it costs, what it takes to have a renewable energy transition. It doesn't factor in the costs for um, the battery storage capacity or for investment in a transmission grid, which is required as you increase the level of renewable energy capacity within the system because as you have increased variable renewable energy, you also need um, variable renewable energy capacity, which is required through the development of a smart transmission grid. Um, in a in what is needed in terms of an energy uh, transition, and so the market is therefore incapable of delivering um, a energy transition. Never mind a just one. Um, and the idea that the current trajectory of things, um, as I said before, is therefore not only misleading; it's also very dangerous. And so even the IEA executive director indicates that despite a record drop in global emissions this year from a report released recently, the world is far from doing enough to put them into a decisive decline. And so we're really on a critical point where we have to say that the trade unions, whilst they may have been uh, pushing for socially owned renewable energy on the basis of jobs and that it's only through uh, a localized renewable energy system that you can create the maximum amount of jobs. We must also understand that that's not the only argument and that they will, are also right in that 
the privately owned renewable energy sector has hit a brick wall and the bidding, the falling bidding prices uh, is actually contributing to that process. And if the costs uh, continue to fall, we will continue to see the investment falling. Alternatively, you can uh, subsidize those investment costs, but then those don't reflect the true levels of the true cost of renewables. So the, what I'm ultimately saying is that, yes, we need to shift dramatically and urgently to a renewable energy transition. Uh, but that the basis for that shift is not uh, on cost. Instead, it's on the basis of a number of other factors. And so in terms of the lessons for South Africa's energy transition, we have to be aware of the fact that as environmentalists, we cannot um, be in support of the REI4P and the unbundling of ESCOM. And as we are in, and that is to say that um, this process, uh, the, the REI4P will continue to lead to a collapse in ESCOM, even if ESCOM shifts to a renewable energy generation through uh, being able to forfeit profits now corporations will be able to out continuously outbid ESCOM until they have been able to achieve uh, a market share and economies of scale. And once that's achieved, the prices will soar. What we really need is to urgently shift to massively mobilize domestic resources of, of investment towards transforming ESCOM into a fully public uh, renewable energy utility. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dominic. Uh, I think for definitely this uh, sort of thought-provoking uh, presentation, uh, and, and a few, I think, a few sobering facts on uh, definitely on the speed of the ongoing transition at a global level, and, and I think you know uh, the fact that it's not going fast enough has been it's been widely acknowledged. I think as you as you pointed out. Uh, but, but I, Galo, it's not not only going fast enough it's actually not going at all and but you can look at the data for yourself uh, um, and <clears throat> I think we we do know what you know we need to 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 get it going and going forward and I guess um, I want to remind first everyone to to ask questions uh, if they have any um, and and I guess for me my the first sort of question that, I, that I'll throw your way is, you know, uh, and, and we kind of alluded to, to it earlier, you know, uh, with, with Mandy is that, um, you know, as, as she indicated, ESCOM has appetite to look at renewable energy. Um, how do you suggest we, we go about this? Uh, we know the current constraints that, uh, that ESCOM is into. We also have to acknowledge that, you know, ESCOM operates within the framework of the RP. Uh, you know, that's where actual decisions are made when it comes to our energy mix or our electricity mix, at least. Um, and that ESCOM doesn't really make the decisions uh, on that end. Um, so how do you see kind of, you know, uh, ESCOM playing a, a much bigger role, you know, going forward? Uh, how do you concretely see that possible uh, to, to make it happen? So in the first instance, you're probably curious about how to resolve the, the financial constraints. Uh, but of course, it's not only the financial constraints. There are many other issues, incentives that contribute to locked in interests within the overall energy sector. But before I get to that, yes, ESCOM doesn't operate in isolation. And ultimately, what we need is a governmental decision what we're seeing from the Dep Department of Public Enterprises, from Treasury, uh, a unified position from the state is that we need to expand the REI4P. And what this means is within the uh, energy mix is that inevitably you will see the collapse of ESCOM uh, because of the way the REI4P functions within the energy mix. And as I was indicating earlier, so the ESCOM death spiral, the, the reason for its debt, we cannot ignore the role that the uh, REI4P sector plays in it. The more people remove demand from ESCOM as they opt out to go to the private sector, 
uh, the more and more the financial constraints and the debt uh, burdens grow for ESCOM. So the REI for P is a critical factor in addition to corruption and wasteful expenditure that is leading to the demise of ESCOM's uh, finances. So yes, we have to talk about it in totality. I agree. Secondly, in terms of the debt, so 480 billion rand in debt, a large portion of this, as we've been uh, indicating previously as AIDC, is located uh, within developmental finance institutions, and a large proportion of this is also held by the Government Employees Pension Fund. Now, currently, the Government Employees Pension Fund has 1,800 trillion rand in accumulated reserves. Most of it is under the asset management of the Public Investment Corporation. Most of this, at least, or almost 60%, is currently invested in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which is heavily overinvested. So as AIDC, we are making the argument that this is not only detrimental to ESCOM or to workers in terms of their pension money, but it's also detrimental to South African society as a whole. And so we are making the argument that through uh, re to shifting uh, resources from the JSE, from the GPF, to the state through domestic through the purchasing of domestic bonds, you can create the necessary space for the state to take over a lot more of ESCOM's debt on condition uh, that it transforms to a fully public renewable energy utility. Now, this is currently in complete contradiction with the way the, the way the government is currently doing it, which is the opposite way. They are saying we're going to finance you from the fiscus through the bailouts on condition that you unbundle. So effectively the state is pushing through a second homegrown, homegrown structural adjustment program since GEAR. Now by liberating these financial resources from the government employees pension fund, placing conditions on ESCOM in the relation to decommissioning, but as well as in the relation to investments toward a large scale public renewable uh, energy utility and system in South Africa would in fact fast track uh, the transition to renewables, whilst at the same time being able to create the space for massive economic growth through fiscal multipliers in what I would call is a orthodox Keynesian macroeconomic framework through investment in uh, productive and infrastructural capacity, uh, the state will grow through the development of aggregate demand. So, I mean, effectively, we cannot ignore the facts, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, thanks, thanks, Samir. Thanks, Dominic. Um, I want to uh, ask everyone to, to still ask uh, their question, if you, if you have any. Um, <clears throat> and I guess maybe just, uh, just one small follow-up, maybe, uh, Dominic. I mean, you know, we obviously, I, uh, I think uh, it's well documented that uh, the, the, the the situation of ESCOM is, is, is linked to a variety of factor and, and I think, of course, you know, uh, I think uh, problems around investments uh, in, in massive coal power stations and mismanagement have been the sort of primary factor to that, to that effect. Um, um, and, and I guess I just want to sort of throw to, to the just transition itself, you know, I mean, you know, be it what had happened in the past, um, the cold fire power stations in South Africa are going to progressively close down, you know, as was highlighted by, by Mandy, but it's also in the RP and it's been well documented that that's the, that's the path forward. Um, what, what do you think is required, not only from ESCOM, of course, um, to ensure just transition um, from your perspective? Those, you know, those, those plants are closing down and, and I think, uh, of course, shifting ESCOM to uh, being a strong renewable energy producer would, could contribute to that, but but it's only part of the solution. It's obviously only part of the answer, um, as we as we pointed out. So just keen to hear your thought on what do you think are some of the important steps to to achieve a just transition within that that sort of dynamic that we're going to see going forward. So we need a society wide. We need a society wide transition that moves us towards a low carbon reindustrialization path, where ESCOM and the energy sector plays a key role. So what this would mean is that yes, we will lose jobs through decommissioning, but through um, 
those who can't be retrained to reskill, giving them a, a living wage grant for that, and reskilling those who can be uh, and retrained is one aspect. But that's only part of the problem. I think we need to think about the creation of uh, millions of more jobs. We need to think about the, uh, the uh, ensure the ensuring and of the provision of key services, social services, including public transport, an expansion of housing, uh, public housing. All of these things will have to be done in a way that is takes um, the carbon our carbon footprint into account. And this is the, a society-wide transition, which requires large scales of investment. Uh, it requires key levels of state planning. Um, and of course, the private sector can play a role, but ultimately it needs to be led by uh, the union movement, by, by uh, unemployed people's movements and the state who sets the agenda and the private sector can then play a key supporting role uh, in that regard. So yes, we do need sort of stakeholder engagements, but unless it's on the terms of the communities of workers, um, I think uh, the transition cannot be a just one. And as I've been trying to say, uh, there's also, we need to talk about how to actually get a transition um, happening. So if we can have frank conversations about what's actually happening in the world in terms of energy, in terms of our carbon emissions um, empirically, and from that, take what needs to be done. We cannot fall into the sensationalist, sensationalist headlines that are saying that the transition is inevitable. It's wrong and it's, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. So that's what I'm calling for, frank conversation amongst us. Um, and it must be led, the transition has to be led by the state, by workers and communities who, who have the most to lose and the most to gain. Thanks a lot, uh, Dominic, for, for that. And you know, we appreciate the, yeah, the, the, the frank and, and, and fresh nature of your insights. I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's why we are as well. I mean, we need those discussions. As we said, we try to provide the platform for this, uh, not trying to replicate echo chambers. Uh, so I think that's good to, to confront views, to confront evidence, um, and, and to engage going forward. Um, Let's now move to uh, to our next our next input. Um, with and uh, saying uh, Koana, uh, she's going to look at uh, an issue that often is is somewhat uh, forgotten uh, when we talk about just transition. Although it has been alluded to um, by uh, I think all all speakers which is around energy, energy access. Uh, and Tavi Singh is a researcher and lex uh, lecturer at the Center for Complex Systems in Transition at the University of Stellenbosch. She's worked extensively on energy uh, policy implementation, particularly around energy access uh, and gender uh, mainstreaming and gender issues in, uh, in the energy sector. Um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Tavi Singh to the stage uh, to unpack some of those key considerations um, which really speak to the ground level impact, the grassroots impact of that transition. Um, we tend to forget that transition is, yes, it is about process, and it is also about the jobs and the livelihood, but it is also about access to, to services and to technologies. That's true in electricity, that's true in other, in other sectors. Um, and Tabi saying, um, the floor is yours. Good morning, Gail, and thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me and uh, for this uh, tips uh, series of webinars. It's very informative, and I'm learning quite a lot also from today's um, uh, from, from my co-presenters. So as you have explained uh, to our audience what you have asked me to do, so um, yeah, I'll be looking at, uh, I'll be talking about energy poverty and, you know, household energy use and how we can link these to the current energy transition conversations. Uh, so from the beginning, <clears throat> I'd just like to say, you know, we talk about social issues concerning energy use, particularly in the low income households and communities. And uh, since we are going through, you know, an energy transition one way or the other, uh, 
um, and given the socioeconomic situations of the country, we know that low income households, not only in Mpumalanga and other coal mining um, um, uh, areas um, and generating communities will be affected. No? Uh, and for the purposes of this presentation, I will talk about energy poverty, energy access, and and use uh, and use of energy just to align these to you know all these upcoming uh, conversations that we're hearing about energy transition, the just energy transition, and what it is, and um, uh, do we have you know a specific definition when it comes to that? Um, so just to start, uh, let's see. Okay, this is uh, my presentation. We follow the structure. I'll talk about energy access and using SA, uh, focusing on low-income households, and then look at energy poverty in South Africa. Look at what connections uh, mean, and do they mean access or, and, or do they mean use? Um, what measures we have in the country to mitigate energy poverty, um, and then look at the COVID-19 impacts because that is also very important. It has contributed a lot to energy poverty in the country. And I'll just take just a small aspect of that to show how big the problem is uh, when it comes to energy poverty. Um, and look at like what the potential solutions are. And I hope that um, our audience and the other panelists will be able to also contribute to this and just, you know, we can have a discussion around this. Um, do we have solutions? Uh, particularly for South Africa, and what is the way forward. Um, so just to give uh, uh, just a short background about household energy use in South Africa. Um, so right now, uh, the current statistics uh, indicate that we have just above 91% of households that have formal electricity connections, which is quite high when you compare it to our neighbors in the other African countries. But many people in the, in the country still rely on traditional energy sources and fuels such as paraffin, um, such as wood um, and, and coal. Um, the state essay um, uh, to, to 2018 report indicates that 16.6 million households use candles as a main lighting source. Now in energy studies, we have always you know, uh, use this, uh, the lighting, lighting as an indicator of energy use in the household. If, an, uh, if a household uses electricity for lighting, then we know that, okay, this is the main energy source that is used by the household. They, at least they have access and they can use uh, the, uh, their access to, to this um, electricity. But 16.6 million households having to use candles shows that a lot of households, even though they do have access to their electricity connections, they still rely on candles, um, which is the worrying factor. Uh, it also indicates that they cannot afford uh, to use uh, to to use their existing electricity connections. So, therefore, electricity connections and access do not equal use, uh, which is a, always a mistake that we often see, especially when we are talking to policymakers. Um, you know, and people that are providing energy services, uh, you know, it's like, oh, we have connected this number of households between this year and that year, but forgetting that connections do not mean that people are able to use that electricity, uh, uh, that electricity because of the costs uh, and because of um, other issues, the socioeconomic issues um, at the household level, at the community level, etc. <clears throat> And then uh, in the past, we've also looked at the household energy transition, what it, what, what it means. It's quite different, of course, from when we're talking about, you know, a, util a utility transitioning from um, um, uh, uh, fossil-based uh, electricity generation. When we're talking about households, I mean, at first we had that misconception that once a household is provided with uh, modern energy, they will automatically transition uh, from using coal um, and paraffin to using electricity. Of course, that is uh, um, uh, also called dependent on, on the household income levels. But what we have seen in the past and in recent years, uh, uh, I mean, this dates back to the um, 
90s when there was this huge you know electrification by ESCOM in the rural areas and the low income areas uh, in South Africa but also as recent as two years ago when we did a study we found that people are still using you know a mix of, uh, of energy sources in their in the households, depending on what they are cooking, on what they can afford, on what time of the month, and also if they are using that particular energy service or energy uh, source for income generating purposes. So what is energy poverty? I've just written a very simple uh, definition, uh, but we have a, a lot of definitions. So what I say is it's an inability to meet your household's um, energy needs, mainly due to cost, which of course affect access and use. Um, and this only this mainly affects low income households, as we know in South Africa, a lot of low income households do not have electricity or are not able to use their uh, their own electricity supply. And access to electricity grid connections does not guarantee use, like I've said, and it also negatively impacts on day to day activities, you can imagine, if one needs to have a bath, they will need to find an alternative. Um, um, uh, source of energy to boil the water. Um, um, now in the times of COVID where we have to wash our hands with warm water and soap all the time, you can imagine households that do not have access to electricity or access to other means of energy, um, how, how, what, what that means for them. It also leads to malnutrition. In the past studies, what we've looked at is, you know, talking to healthcare, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, healthcare units within townships and talking about uh, the nutrition, you know, levels um, in the areas. We found that um, what we have been told is that uh, uh, people, or they, they, uh, the healthcare workers, are seeing quite a lot of people that are being uh, are malnutrition, and that's because cooking has become quite expensive. If you're going to cook using electricity, it's quite expensive. So people tend to um, eat um, um, fast foods uh, instead of instead of uh, cooking because it's just it's just too expensive. And people uh, use harmful energy sources, which lead to respiratory and other illnesses. And it also uh, energy poverty also limits income generating options to those that don't rely on en or, or, or that that uh, don't rely on energy. Uh, so it also decreases a uh, sense of security, especially among women and girls. So what are the measures that have been put in place in South Africa to mitigate energy poverty? Well, um, I'm just going to look at the at the subsidies, uh, I'm looking at the free basic electricity subsidy, which was introduced in, in, in South Africa, where uh, it was found households that had uh, new electricity connections were not using the electricity to their full capacity. And on going back to see what was the problem, we found that a lot of people could not afford to use their electricity to its full capacity because it was just too expensive. So, um, you know, when you look at what is the basic amount of electricity that a household can survive on, then it was, you know, in the mid nineties, we found that 50 units of electricity could be, you know, an amount that at least ensures that households have the basic um, access to electricity use, you know, they can light, they can use a small, a small radio or a small TV, they can have, you know, a small fridge, uh, or have a two plate stove that they can use um, uh, with that amount of electricity. Of course, now things have changed. The tariffs have gone up. People are not able to afford, um, um, I mean, 50 units of electricity is not much at all for, for a household. Um, so, um, thousand registered indigent customers qualifying for this free basic electricity, but only 700,000 households are accessing it. And this is also because of lack of knowledge. People do not know that they qualify for this, but also because um, municipalities, local municipalities who are in charge of distributing you know, in some of these areas, 
um, also do not have the capacity to figure out who are the indigent households and who qualifies for this. So you find that even though there are households that qualify for it, they cannot access it because of such issues. Uh, there's also the free basic alternative energy subsidy, the subsidy which uh, um, is mainly for non-electrified households and off-grid electric, uh, off electrified indigent households. And these are mainly in the rural areas. So um, uh, what we've seen is that a local, uh, uh, not a lot of local municipalities, only 49 um, uh, in, in, in 2018, only 49 local municipalities indicated that they are providing uh, this uh, free basic alternative energy subsidy. Um, and in, uh, this is provided in the form of um, giving people paraffin, a, set, a number of liters of paraffin per month, or giving them candles, a number of, of candles per month or gel fuel. And for those that have solar home systems, what the municipality does is to, uh, with this is to pay the fee for service for this solar home system. And you can see there the numbers that we have at least 3.5 million households that do have the solar home systems that, and are, 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 are benefiting from this uh, free basic alternative energy subsidy. Um, yeah. So a whole lot of people are depending, uh, are depending on this. But we also have to keep in mind that not all the municipalities can afford to, to, to provide this, uh, this subsidy uh, because um, the free basic alternative energy subsidy is not ring fenced. So if there are other priorities within the municipality, what they do is spend that money on those priorities. Um, and it's also uh, the issues, the administrative issues of actually gathering and ensuring that you have, you know, this, the number um, or all the uh, number of qualifying households. Well, um, the, the study I conducted between 2010 and 2014 showed that it was difficult uh, to, to actually figure out who qualifies uh, because household, um, 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 uh, household, uh, you know, situations change all the time. Uh, people get um, uh, uh, basic income grants, um, people get uh, pension grants, and people move, especially from rural areas to urban areas. So those, uh, the economic, um, the household economic situations change all the time. So it's difficult to keep track of who is an indigent household or, and who is not. And for um, municipalities based in rural areas, it's even more difficult. Is this enough? So this is a question that I'm posing to my co-panelists and to the audience. Um, or do we need to find other solutions? Um, and looking at you know what we are faced with right now, that COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it has had devastating economic and social impacts worldwide. And we've all felt it. We all know it. It has affected each and every one of us. And uh, to date, these are the numbers, you know, infections uh, globally have reached 57 million and the deaths have just gone up to 1.3 million. And in South Africa, we've had uh, 751 inf infections to, to, to date and 20, just over 20,000 deaths, um, uh, which is quite serious. And the negative impacts of this, of course, beyond that, and, uh, and the infections is that there has been loss of jobs. Now in an economy like South Africa that was already suffering before, before COVID, we've seen the employment rate at a record high. Just last week, it was uh, announced that it has reached 30.8%, uh, which is a record high. It's, it's never been there before. Um, and in South Africa, what COVID has done, it has, really, it has revealed the reality of our poverty levels. You know, it just, showed us how poor and how divided our country is and how you know there's this poverty gap is quite huge you know uh the the gap between the haves and the have-nots is very very big and and, and COVID, uh, COVID has really show, showed us that um and this has also had negative impacts on energy access and use because people could not or cannot afford um, energy for lighting, cooking, and space heating. Even though people were presented with um, uh, what uh, food food packages, um, 
you know, they were not presented with uh, uh, electricity credits or a liters of paraffin to cook the food. So uh, that means that, you know, uh, households that were already suffering or experiencing energy poverty, that continued and COVID made it even worse. They were not able to pay their bills and to buy prepaid electricity. And people also uh, turned to social media, like using Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and whatever, to ask for help uh, because it actually reached that point where people would take to public platforms and say, can you please help me? And what I did uh, in the, this was uh, just to um, say that it was not um, a formal study, but just out of interest and, you know, being interested in the energy poverty issues. What I did was just to follow, particularly on Twitter. But um, what I saw is that people were asking for help um, for, uh, you know, uh, for, for energy in, in social media platforms. So just uh, what I did is just to screen grab a few um, of these you see the requests, people asking, can you please buy me electricity and showing a photo of their meter. Um, um, and, you know, like we say, um, poverty strips you of your dignity. And you can imagine energy poverty is also, it's also the same. You just, you know, uh, just tell yourself, okay, this is what I'm going to do because I don't have any other alternative. Um, and they were tagging, you know, popular shows and, popular um, uh, what uh, celebrity, uh, celebrities and um, influencers to just um, try to get some help. Um, and the result was that people were actually responding and responding positively to this, which also showed that, um, uh, you know, when there is a call uh, um, uh, with regards to energy poverty, there are solutions that we've never looked at um, as people, that, as pra practitioners in the, in the energy space. Um, I mean, who would have thought that social media could be one of the things that one could, would, could tend to um, in this particular way? I know crowdfunding has been done for maybe energy units and all of that, but this kind of thing. But COVID has also uh, given us and provided us with, you know, innovative ways of trying to raise funds uh, for uh, where energy is concerned. Um, so, I mean, it's showing us that there are potential um, uh, solutions, social solutions to, to energy poverty. And in the past, electricity was never seen as a social energy source like paraffin. You know, with paraffin, you could go to your neighbor and ask for a cup of paraffin so that you could uh, boil, you know, one liter of water quickly. But with electricity, it was never seen like that among the low-income area, along the low-income uh, households. But you know, COVID has showed us that maybe, maybe it is, and maybe we could find new ways of trying to alleviate energy poverty using um, you know, innovative, uh, innovative ways. Now, uh, solving energy poverty through a just uh, energy transition, I have more questions than answers here. And um, I mean, for me, it depends on how this energy transition is impl implemented, who is driving it and what their priorities are and what the costs are. And uh, what does the uh, just transition mean uh, for the South African context, the, the context at the beginning, Gaylo, you mentioned you were talking about. You know, we we don't have a clear definition, and uh, the other panelists were also, you know, emphasized on that as well. And maybe that's the starting point for us as as a country, as practitioners, as academics, as everyone that is working here. What does it mean for South Africa? There's a fear of loss of jobs in the coal and electricity generation um, sectors. There are speculations that communities in these areas will experience negative socioeconomic effects. And um, what, uh, and South Africa is placed at number 106 out of 115 countries where we are where, that were measured for readiness for energy, you know, measured by performance of other energy, of their energy systems and their read, readiness of the transition to secure sustainable, affordable, and inclusive systems. So are we, are we even ready for, for this? 
So considering energy poverty, is the just energy transition on, or, um, on increasing tariffs and what are the implications um, of this? Because we know that it, uh, the, the tariffs that are applied will have to be you know, cost reflective. And if these tariffs increase um, to, from what electricity costs are right now, it means that more people from the, in the population will be left out, will be excluded. Is that what we want? Um, and how can we mitigate that? Uh, could we consider cost reflective tariffs supported by fiscal policy that will ensure benefits for the poor? And um, in other words, can the free basic electricity and free basic alternative energy uh, policies or, or subsidies be drastically extended to achieve a just energy transition? Gaylo, this is my last slide. Um, so the assumption is that the renewable energy um, um, or is that the transition will be renewable energy led. You know? And, and that the prices, because uh, you know, there'll be more, there's, there'll be a, a high demand, so the prices will drop. But what is that based on? Because if we take a step back and reflect on the prices, we'll see that this is based on imported, imported products, which of course lower the costs. But what do, I mean, in South Africa, we, we, we have to think, you know, when we're talking about the just energy transition, we also have to think about you know, the communities locally, the jobs and everything. So what does it mean if we were to manufacture the components locally and these parts? Um, of course, the prices go up. Um, but, you know, so it means that there's something that needs to be done. So like investments in the, in the renewable energy in, in industrialization initiatives, subsidies for affordable pricing, a review of the current uh, subsidies, the, the FBE and the FBAE, and um, also review and not miss the opportunities that, that are presented by the transition, which uh, look at the inclusion of historically uh, disadvantaged groups, um, you know, especially also women, how are they going to take part in this transition? What is going to be their role? What are they going to be benefiting? Uh, and how is this going to uh, contribute to the country's economic growth? What about the skills development, the repurposing and all of that? There's also a need for different stakeholders to collaborate. Practitioners, my colleagues have also uh, spoken about that uh, now, you know, the utilities, the IPPs and all of that. And we also need in-depth objective socioeconomic studies as well uh, to focus on the JET. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, this was my last slide. I know I'm over time. Um, I'm sorry about that. Thank you so much, uh, and Tabi Sang. I think that was a really uh, impactful presentation, uh, and you know, it's really a perspective that that must not be forgotten as we talk about just transition. I think it's too often forgotten, you know, um, and, and I think we, we need to really look at at those issues of energy access uh, a lot, uh, a, a lot more. Uh, seriously overall, but I think within the context of the just transition particularly. Um, just uh, I mean, a couple of couple of, of questions, I guess. Um, you, you spoke about the role of, of municipalities and, and you know, there was some some discussions going on in the Q&A as well around this, you know. Um, so just interested in, in how you see municipalities being able to to play a role uh, in, in answering the question. You know, we we have no uh, regulations that allow municipalities uh, hypothetically to play a bigger role in renewable energy, um, but as limited to, I guess, uh, municipalities in good financial standing. Uh, we know the difficulty of that. Um, so just I get to hear your thought on, on, on the role of municipalities and how that can be, uh, that can be uh, articulated. There's a question as well around um, the health cost. And have you, have you looked at, at that specifically or are there particular uh, studies that we can consider on the health cost of current uh, energy sources, but also lack of, lack of energy, lack of access to energy. Um, and I guess my, my last question for, for now is that uh, we have this 91% headline number, you know, 
But that's kind of, if we start disaggregating about what that means you know, in terms of the quality of the access, um, then, you, then, you, then you tend to have much lower numbers um, than, than those kind of critical headline, like 91%. And we have a very similar situation in water transportation, for example. Um, so just interested in, do you have a, a, a better understanding? I mean, you know, you, you put some staggering numbers, you know, 16 million people still using candle for, for light. I mean, you know, in, 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 in South Africa, that's, you know, um, that's really shocking, really, you know, to, 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 to think about that. So, so maybe if you can just expand a little bit on what's behind that sort of 91%, that would, that would be really useful. Um, yeah, let me leave it at this for now uh, and see how it goes. Okay, Gaila, thank you very much for the questions um, and the questions from um, our audience. Well, with regards to the role of municipalities, um, you know, having been given now the right uh, to generate their own uh, renewable energy and all of that. But I think what is most important is ensuring that the municipalities have the capacity that they need um, to, to make sure that they can implement, um, you know, whatever energy policy that is given uh, to them to implement. Because, you know, they are the closest to the communities, they are the closest to the people that they are providing services uh, to, but at the same time, they are the least capacita um, capacitated um, entities what you know what i found with the, with the study that i conducted was that there was just an overwhelming demand of services that need to be provided by the municipalities the policies are made at a higher level and then you know they trickle down and at the end of the day it's the municipalities responsibilities to make sure that all of that is implemented and you find that especially with the smaller municipalities municipalities and in, in rural areas that's quite a heavy load to carry uh, because they they are not you know um, properly skilled for all of this that is coming um, a, a their way and they already have you know capacity issues that they cannot meet um, and all of that so i think first of all before anything we have to ensure that municipalities have the support that they need um, from skills uh, to making sure that they have um, the resources, they have the infrastructure, they have all of that. And um, I think that that would be a good start. That's, that's my personal opinion. I don't have the health costs, but I know that who uh, the WHO has conducted some studies, especially on the use of uh, wood, um, uh, um, you know, from burning it to connect to collecting it, and they've conducted some studies on on how um, these have these affect, uh, or you you'll be able to find figures there, uh, the health figures with that, and the ninety one percent, and that. Um, you know the figure of the of the candle use that 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 is quite shocking, but it is the reality that we 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 have in South Africa. Like I was explaining during my my presentation, mm -hmm. is that you know the ninety one percent is the number of connections, but it doesn't mean that those that are connected can use you know that supply because of the different. Uh, household conditions that they they find themselves um, they find themselves in not being able to afford even that 20 rents to buy that electricity which you know puts them at a at a disadvantage so 91 percent is the number of people that do have these electricity connections but we also know that in south africa we have so many households uh, that are informal that are not provided uh, with electricity connections because of their informal state. And some of them have been there for more than 10 years, but because they are still seen as informal, they do not have. So actually, maybe the number should be, you know, um, rethought uh, because there are more people than, than, than meets the connections uh, that we have like on paper. There are more people that actually still lack access 
to modern energy services like that, like electricity, um, and which contributes to broader energy poverty in the in the country. Hence, you see a lot of people still relying on candles for lighting. There's a big number for South Africa for South Africa that has you know, 91% of electricity connections, there's something that is not balancing there. But it also tells you about the, you know, the people that are living in the backyards and the people that are living in the shacks that are not, you know, documented um, as, as not having access to electricity because they, they are, they are, their settlements or households are not counted as formal. Yeah, I hope that answers it. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that was, that was great. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was great. Um, but we, we're nearing we're nearing uh, the end of our uh, of our session for today. Um, so I want to give uh, each of our uh, panelists uh, the opportunity to to come in for a minute or two uh, for any any parting shot, um, any key message um, coming out of today um, that doesn't have to be from your presentation. Uh, you know anything that really you want you want to. Uh, to push forward, and you'd like people to, uh, to to remember and take away out of out of today's station. We've heard a lot, um, but just one uh, one key point that you think uh, should be uh, should be emphasized. Um, Mandy, can I can I start with you? Yes, sure. Thanks, Gayla. Thanks for a fascinating discussion. I think lots of uh, interesting viewpoints. Um, if I could just say one thing, I think, you know, there are a lot of issues to solve in South Africa. We have a complexity of issues. Um, and I don't think the just transition is a panacea. And, you know, certainly we're not seeing it as a panacea. But it does go a long way in solving a lot of these complex issues. Um, so I think, you know, I would, I'm not uh, being um, overlooking the complexity and the issues that people have raised. But I think we need to start being solution oriented um, and look at what are the solutions that are fit for purpose that will work in, the, in our country. And I said it in my presentation and I'll say it again, let's look at uh, these solutions from a collaborative perspective. How do we work together to bring these solutions to the table? Thanks, Gaylo. Thanks a lot, Mandy. Uh, solution oriented, practical, fit for purpose. I think we, yeah, we can all agree on that. Uh, that's, that's the way to, to, to go ahead. Um, Richard, any last point? Yeah, the one I would just like to, uh, people may have, well, have, will have obviously noticed in the countries I gave, they're all global north countries. Um, and when we were putting this report together, we did realize that what, well, what's happening in the global south. And you look for examples of coal transition, it, it's really just not happening yet. So the takeaway from this is that um, although you can adapt these lessons from other countries, it really is about what happens locally. And in a sense, we really need to develop and create what works for South Africa under our circumstances. And, and the way to do that is, is via discussions like this, uh, via transparency of, of information and all of those things. Um, so although it, this is going to be a big challenge, really working together at, at the local level and, and understanding what it is that South Africa needs, I, I think is where we need to go. Um, and just to piggyback on what I was saying was saying like, that was our first sort of building block is that although yeah, there is coal and there's renewables and there's the big you know, shift in energy mix, energy poverty is a real issue. And that's, that's partly what we're looking at in our current study. And, and in this transition, how do we look after those who are suffering with these energy access problems? Um, and um, yeah, we are carrying on work on that. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an important point, you know, that uh, the North, it, it's global North is, is more advanced in that respect. And they've gone, countries have gone through this transition. Um, and I think in the global South, we're still, we're still dealing with it. Uh, very much so, and, and we can't just directly transpose uh, lessons. And I think you know that's that's true in this case. It's true in, in in most cases. We need to find the solutions for ourselves that are that are relevant for South Africa, but also for local context. Um, you know, be it be it Mumalanga, be it, be it any uh, any other uh, place in the country. Um, over to Dominic. Um, thanks, Gaylo, and thanks to everyone who stayed with us all this time. So, is the REAP um, not good enough. Uh, so Africa is one of the biggest carbon emitters in the world and disproportionately so at least we will see some change. 
based on the facts, based on an, uh, applying those facts in an argument to a logic or biological conclusion, it's not, it's not going to be good enough. It's especially not going to be good enough when you also have more than 11 million people who's unemployed and incomparable levels of inequality. So in that regard, the idea that the transition is inevitable suits the market, but it takes us closer to ecological and social collapse. The cost of the transition or the cost of renewables cannot be or is not the motivation for a shift. There's much more important and fundamental reasons. And to do it is going to require a massive change. And that might not seem practical, but that is actually the only way we will be actually we will be able to survive. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. I think you're reiterating again the transition that we need is not is not underway. Uh, we need we need a, a different transition um, and, and and a lot more proactive and, and a lot more action um, and and really I think everyone needs to play a part in this. You know, um, and, and that's really important. Um, all right, and Debbie saying uh, over to you, uh, back to you for for last uh, last point. Yeah, thank you. I think for me is that we should always keep in mind the issues of energy access when we're talking about um, a, you know a just transition. It's not only access as in like the electricity or electric electricity connections. It's about really access at the ground level. How is the just transition ensuring that people have access to um, a safe, sustainable and modern energy services that they can afford uh, so that we don't leave anyone behind. We, we've gone past that time where uh, we make plans with others are going to be left behind or are going to be further excluded uh, from, 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 from you know, development. Uh, uh, so this transition should be inclusive and we should always make sure that um, uh, you know the previously disadvantaged are actually at the forefront and are able to benefit uh, from it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Singh. I think yeah, energy access, energy access, energy access, and I think you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that uh, definitely. Um, I've got uh, less than a minute to uh, really thank uh, our, our panelists for their time, uh, insight and expertise, to thank all of you for attending uh, this uh, session and for staying with us. Uh, a reminder that uh, the recordings as well as presentations from the previous uh, events are available on the TIPS website. Uh, you will receive later this week the uh, recording as well as presentation from this very uh, webinar. Uh, and um, we encourage you to attend our next session, uh, which uh, invites will go out for uh, this week, which we look at financing the just transition. It will be on the 1st of December. It will be the last one for this year before we all go on a much, much deeper break. Um, be on the lookout for the invitation. Thank you again, everyone. It was my pleasure to facilitate the session this morning. Um, have a good day further. Have a good week. Uh, and see you next time.